How do I read the book of 2 Corinthians? This letter is a very personal one for Paul and tells us a lot about his life and ministry. This book is written by Paul, who we have covered in depth in previous videos, but it also says, and Timothy, who would have assisted with the letter. Timothy represented Paul in certain churches such as Corinth or Philippi and was later a pastor in Ephesus. But we will come back to him when we get to the letters Paul wrote to him. Who was it written to? It is written to the church in Corinth, as was the last letter. It was a troubled church with a fraught relationship with Paul at this point. We covered further details about the church in Corinth in the last video, but it's worth noting here that Paul also includes on this all the saints who were in the hall of Archaea. This is the surrounding region around Corinth. As Corinth was a major city in the area, it would be fair to see the region as the result of the church in Corinth reaching out and would have been influenced by the church in Corinth, positively and negatively. So Paul wanted to ensure that they felt included in the letter. Many of the issues that were addressed in 1 Corinthians had worsened since then. When was it written? It was approximately AD 55 to 57, around a year after the writing of 1 Corinthians. Before we go into details, how could we describe this book in one sentence? Paul defends his ministry to the troubled Corinthian church and speaks out against those who were leading it astray. Why did he write it and how can we understand this book? 1 Corinthians was delivered by Timothy, which, remember, was the second letter Paul had written to them, but the first one is now lost. With Paul intending to head to Macedonia when he left Ephesus, he then planned to head south and spend the winter in Corinth, but those plans had to change. When Timothy arrived, he sent a report to Paul telling him things were worse than ever here. So Paul went to Corinth, his second visit to the city. The visit was a total disaster, and he had to leave soon after arriving. In 2 Corinthians 2, he describes the visit, For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. He also describes it in 2 Corinthians 13 too. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. There had been a confrontation with the self-appointed leaders in Corinth who were even calling themselves apostles. They didn't want Paul in Corinth and they insulted him and his ministry. Paul then sent his third letter to Corinth. It is now lost, but it seems to have been a tearful letter demanding the church deal with these ringleaders. It was delivered by Titus, who was the sort of guy who wouldn't just deliver the letter, but would back it up. It's sometimes called the severe letter. He refers to it in 2 Corinthians 2 verses 3 and 4. For I wrought to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love I have for you. Clearly his heart was broken over the state of this church. Paul writes here that if the letter caused you pain, I don't regret it. It needed to do that. And that pain led to repentance. And it seems that's just what the letter did. When Paul encountered Titus in Macedonia, he was delighted to find out the crisis was over and the church had repented. There were still issues and challenges to Paul's ministry from some of those so-called apostles, but the behaviour of the church had changed. Paul was delighted to write to them again, his fourth and final letter to them that we know as 2 Corinthians. In this letter, he defends his authority against those still causing problems, and he calls them out. After writing this, his third and final visit to Corinth was a happy one, where relationships were restored and an offering for Jerusalem was taken, and not long after, Paul would be arrested. 
We can break this letter down into three areas. First, there's Paul's defence. Third, there's Paul's attack. And in the middle, Paul talks about the offering for famine relief. This letter is the most personal of all of Paul's letters. It's nearly all about his ministry and his experiences. And Paul addresses the bad leaders. These leaders were slick, rich and claimed to be special apostles, super apostles if you will. They criticised everyone who would come before them in order to build themselves up. Anyone who has to push down on someone else to make themselves look big, those people are trouble. And they were doing this to Paul. And these guys were thorough. They criticised everything about Paul, both his message and his ministry. They called him fickle, cowardly, unqualified, asking where his letters of recommendation came from, because these false apostles made sure they had a piece of paper, seeing how good they were. They said he was timid in person, not a great speaker. They criticised him because he didn't charge a fee. In Greece, entertainment was provided by travelling philosophers, and the bigger the fee charged, the greater the reputation of the speaker. So chapters 1 to 7 are Paul's defence. He doesn't charge a fee? That's because the gospel is for everyone, and he wanted them to receive it for free. He did it like that for their benefit. Timid? Timid, he says. He says, remember the last painful visit I just had? That was anything but timid. And as Paul defends himself, he brings out some powerful statements about what it means to follow Jesus and minister the gospel. This is not about the glamorous lifestyle of the super apostles, but suffering as Christ suffered. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We aren't peddlers of God's word, but given a commission. We don't promote ourselves, but Jesus. He talks about earthly and godly sorrow and true repentance that he's now seen in this church. Chapters 8 and 9 are talking about the offering for the suffering saints, an encouragement, not a command, to give. He's saying their giving is a reflection of where their hearts are, and in the past it had not been good. But now they are in a better place. That should be reflected in their generosity. He also commends Titus in this part for the work he has done there. Then in chapters 10 to 13, he goes on the attack. He gives these false apostles both barrels. He uses lots of irony and sarcasm. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. He compares these false apostles to Satan. Even he can pretend to be an angel of light, just as these people pretend to be of the faith. But they will get what's coming to them. He says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea, in toil, in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger, in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And you call me weak and fickle? He says he met Jesus. He was taken up to the third heaven. And you ask if I'm qualified? When I was with you, there were signs and wonders, and you ask what confirms that I was preaching the true gospel? He keeps saying, look, if you want me to boast, I can boast, but I choose not to do that because it's not about me, it's about Jesus. Paul then ends by saying, check your motivation. Check you are in the faith or you could end up shipwrecked. In other words, check yourself before you wreck yourself. 
This letter gives a rare insight into how the Apostle Paul coped with opposition and so provides an excellent model for God's servants to follow, wherever they may be serving and whoever their opponents might be. Paul goes to such lengths in his defence and attack, not for his own reputation, but for the reputation of the gospel and to show up the false apostles because he loves the church and doesn't want to see it drift. There are parallels today. These super apostles still exist. Servants of God are still attacked as Paul was, whether they be pastors, evangelists or prophets. And they should note the importance of standing firm on the gospel and like Paul, they should seek to see that their motivation is correct.